a lot of business people and developers think that now they can just create these communities. Basically, basically it's kind of like a, a, a like how we have gated communities here, and that's kind of everyone's like American dream. If I can get like a big three, four bedroom house, however many square feet is your dream, <laughs> and then you know you get to live in in this uh, really clean cut community and and just just not really work is it, I guess is like a lot of people's fantasy is is that life would be great if I just didn't have to work at all or work hard. Um, and just have everything taken care of. And that's kind of the appeal of leisure land. And, and the big incentive for being small is that you don't really have to work as hard anymore because the little bit of money that you made as a big person will carry you so much further in the small world. She organized a lot of political protests against, you know, larger interests who against the government and against industry. And so she was punished and put in jail and also made small as a punishment. And she was put into a, a television box, a TV box, along with some other political prisoners and shipped overseas. And she ended up um, sustaining injuries and getting an infection on her leg. And so her leg had to be amputated. That's why she's in the condition that you see in the movie. I don't really think much of him other than that this is a guy who I can use because I notice that he has skills that I can use to, to go and help other people that I'm trying to help right now because I think that he has a lot of medical knowledge probably like much, you know, here I am just taking random prescription drugs and, and just kind of giving them to, to sick people hoping that maybe it's the right thing. And so when I meet him and I see that he has some sort of medical background, that really is great because I can use this guy. And, and so that's why I forced him to come home with me. <laughs> She's very bossy um, and very demanding and kind of, which can be off-putting and difficult for people, but at, at the heart of it, it's because she has, she sees that she has so much work to do and she's trying to help all of these people who are sick and, and they don't really have anyone to take care of them and she sees that and that's what drives her and propels her to, to work so hard and, and so that makes her, yeah, a little bit tired and grumpy and, and bossy. And, but, you know, thankfully, Paul is a really good man <laughs> who just, who kind of submits to, to it and, um, and helps her out. And, and I think that's where the, the, the love sort of like blossoms out of that because she sees what a good person he is. He's a basically decent guy who doesn't do anything bad and tries to help out here and there when he can and, and doesn't have like this grand idea of what his his purpose in life is or what he's going to do. And I think most people sort of rec like Paul, he recognizes that there are a lot of problems in the world, but isn't really sure what he just one guy, one regular ordinary guy can do about it um, because we always think like, oh, we have to do something drastic. There has to be some sort of miracle that comes down and saves the world or saves humanity. And what can I do? I'm just one person. And she has a completely different attitude about that where it's like you do what you can, you know, and if everybody just did that, we would change the world. And so I think by getting to know her and, and having her sort of beat that into his head you know he has this this realization at the end that if we just each took personal responsibility and just did a little bit um you know everything would just be different he's perfect he's he's really smart He's really generous as like a scene partner. Um, 
He's always trying to take care of everyone. He's a problem solver. He's kind of just like a dream to like have around and and to to have in the cast. I know like Alexander really appreciates him. Um, everything that he brings to the movie and to the role. And I know that he's probably said before in other interviews or, or something that Matt is really kind of only the the only major movie star who is kind of still an everyday, who has that everyday man quality about him. And that's really true. He's just a guy that you'd love to go and have a beer with, and, and he just seems unintimidating and just a regular guy. And so that's, that's what, those are the qualities that, that Matt innately brings to the, to the character, to the role. Um, but also because Matt is a very caring person who is interested in world affairs, is interested in what's going on with um, water uh, distribution and availability in developing countries and particularly for women and, and young girls in, in, those, in those parts of the world. And because he's a curious person and because we all know this about Matt, his, his, who he is as, as, a, as a public persona because that's already built into who Matt Damon is or who we think we know Matt Damon is. I think that that's helpful in bringing it into the character because Paul Safranek is also a man who is interested in helping out other people, is interested in um, making people's life situation better if he can. And it's and it's something that deeply hurts and affects him if he can't do that. It's a great role. I get to do everything. I get to be ridiculous. I get to be angry. I get to be loved. I get to um, do physical things. It's a physical challenge to do this role. So it's very rare that you get the full combination of all of those things for a man or a woman. You know, it's not just that it's a great female role. It's a great role, period. They are just fantastic in, in, in bringing things that are familiar characters that you think you've seen often and you think you, you what 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 else is there left to explore about these people that are just very ordinary and you and and there's nothing you know unusual or dramatic about them how can you create drama and comedy out of these people but it's just about everyday life and normal people where you can draw the most comedy and the most drama because it is so real and and and, and so specific and that's what the, the strength of the, the story is, is that they are able to pull so many specific instances of, um, of life. I think most of what he, Alexander and Jim write is satire, and, and that's kind of, I think that's the easiest way for us to recognize the truth in something is if we can sort of enter into it through laughter and through humor and through satire and through making fun of ourselves and and it's it's a much it's an easier message to receive if it's kind of coded in in satire and in comedy We all know that Alexander Payne is one of the greatest American directors, dead or alive, and he's had this impressive body of work, and this is the first time that he's had to work with special effects, and, and this is the first time it wasn't just like a, a small, intimate story that happened in Omaha. You know, I, I think like that's what a lot of people come to expect when they think of an Alexander Payne film is that it's going to be a small, intimate story about, you know, just a, a guy or just like a, a family. It's a very small thing. And this is like a whole sprawling story. And there's all of these different sets and places that you go to. And there's all of these people. It's an international cast. 
Hey, so stay with me as I have a bonus behind the scenes movie fact for you. Did you know that for the movie The Social Network, rather than use a split screen, David Fincher shot most of the Winklevice scenes with the two actors, Armie Hammer and Josh Pence, and digitally grafted the former's face onto the latter in post-production. The two actors went to twin boot camp to match up their body language, while Pence's face got a cameo during a party scene. Whoa. What's your favorite David Fincher film? Let me know in the comments below. And remember, we publish new videos every day, so be sure to subscribe for more great content. Bye-bye.